welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We are in a tight time frame, so we're going to be starting right now at 11. I'm your host, Howard Tedeswa. I'd like to thank today's panelists for gener generously uh, giving of their time to help our colleague, Alain Arsenault, who is dealing with some major health challenges. I was just in touch with him yesterday, and he sends his gratitude uh, to everyone here for all that they're doing. Uh, if you haven't already donated to the GoFundMe we have, that we've set up for Alain, please do so after the webinar using the GoFundMe link that will appear on your screen after the webinar ends. And I think that we have it also up in the chat. We're very fortunate today to have an incredible group of leaders and authors in agile development and in business analysis, all in the same room, uh, as well as practice leads who are improving the comp competencies within their own organizations today. Our panelists are a who's who in the world of agile development and business analysis, and they include uh, Scott Ambler, Joy Beatty, Kevin Brennan, Mike Cohen, Brianna Ertinen, Andre Franklin, who we're still waiting for, so we hope you make it, Andre, uh, Ivar Jakobsen, Gladys yeah. Lamb, Dana Mitchell, and Angela Wick. And of course, our moderator today will be, and we're very lucky to have him here, Adrian Reed. The topic of today's discussion is enterprise agility, a crucial enabler for the next normal. We're looking forward to an enlightening discussion. So time is tight. I'm going to pass it right on to you, Adrian. Take it away. Fantastic. Thanks, Howard. And I, I just echo um, Howard's comments there. And for those of you tuning in, um, remember, this is a free webinar to join, but it isn't a free webinar to leave. So before you leave, <laughs> be, be sure to, uh, to uh, put some money into the GoFundMe. It's an absolutely fantastic cause. So I thought a useful place to start would be around that sort of buzzword, important buzzword of, of maturity. And a lot's written about agility. There are varying frameworks, approach, approaches, methods, and methodology. So I thought a first question for us to mull over as a panel is, how mature are our methods and our frameworks? And you know, to what extent does maturity actually matter? And I'm gonna randomly pick on Dana I wonder whether you've got a view on, on maturity. And of course you can pass because I've put you on the spot. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, so maturity, in my opinion, looks something like a continuous flow of uh, planning, a continuous flow of work in process, and a continuous flow of work getting out the door that your customers love. Right. And so I think when we talk about is your method mature, I think that if your method is supporting that kind of a culture and that kind of a, um, a reach towards your, your customer, then you're definitely on step. You know, you're, 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 you're in the right place for maturity. And, you know, Agile has been around for quite a while. Right. And we're seeing many ways of implementing it. But what really matters is, are you serving your customers? Are you serving your internal people? And are your, is your staff happy and engaged and kind of coming to work with those bubbles that, you know, that, that get us the great stuff, the innovation? Yeah, yeah. So actually the, the results, the engagement, the actual outcomes are, are important. So um, I, I don't know, maybe if I bring Kevin in here, I mean, what, what would your view on maturity be? Uh, you know, are, are we mature and, and does it matter? Uh, you know, from the perspective of enterprise agility, Adrian, I don't know that it does. I mean, we need to ask what maturity is, right? It comes down to you process be, or a procedure or a practice becomes mature when you know exactly what it is you have to do, when you can do it repeatedly, repeatedly, right? Where you can maximize the efficiency, pull out all of the waste. And you know what? When you're getting to that point, that also means that it's very stable, that things aren't changing. And, you know, agility is not, being agile is not about keeping things from changing. It's about continuous change. And in your, if you're in an environment of continuous change, your practices should be changing too. So I don't know that maturity is the goal to strive towards. I think you have to be looking at what are the outcomes we are trying to produce and what is the thing that we have to do now to get there? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Because maturity, to me at least, almost implies there's a benchmark that you that you benchmark yourself against. And actually, if, if, we're, if we're being adaptive and needing to have those dynamic capabilities and change, then it's actually a really interesting, uh, a really interesting topic to consider. Um, I, I, Ivar, would you have a view on maturity? Oh, you bet. 
Uh, I have actually prepared a few slides here. Fantastic. Uh, what a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's almost like we planned this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I'll see if I can get the slides up. Uh, are they there now? No. No. no uh, share the, if you need to share the PowerPoint application and have the PowerPoint up first. Is that? Yeah, that is up, but I, I was... Um, you have to uh, I pressed the share, 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 share screen, right? Yeah. Right. So at the bottom, there should be a green button to share screen. Ah, it's there we go. We yes. Yes. Okay, go. good. Great, great. I'm so sorry, uh, but you know, <laughs> since I am not the natives and American, I, I take a little bit more text. So this is my um, a few slides here. Uh, are we driven by fashion? If we look at how we have dealt with methods over years. Uh, it definitely may look like we are driven by fashion. What we did uh, uh, many years ago, 20, in the 70s, it was function and data. 30 years ago, it was all about objects. That's when I mm. uh, made my days, you know. And 25 years ago, I also was there with UML, Unified Process, Component-Based Development. 20 years ago, we had a CMMI. Do you remember CMMI? Mm. How yeah. popular that was, crazy days, you know. And then we got uh, eventually Nirvana, okay, Agile, and so on. Now it's all scaling Agile. What do we have tomorrow? All of this is good, so that's not the problem. So what is the problem? Here's some things. Uh, I need to fix, I can read. Uh, <laughs> so we are at the Methods War for 50 years. I mean, can we... Uh, and, and every time the, the really great people in the world, many of them become methodologists and then they fight other methodologists <laughs> instead of collaborating. And that has gone on for 50 years, uh, maybe even longer, but uh, say 50. And it still goes on and we don't see an end to it. Uh, we have practices, they are locked in method prisons, meaning uh, the practice are not modulized in such a way so other people can use them. Instead, they have to rewrite them. And that happens. So, for instance, uh, one of the most popular practices is SCUM. SCUM is taken into many other methods, but in these other methods, they are rewritten because it doesn't really fit the style of the, the, the uh, method and uh, the guru that stands behind it. And method prisons are controlled by gurus, which are methodology states people. 80% of success here is about um, marketing. And uh, unfortunately, expertise is uh, not the most important um, component. And, and I actually talk about myself too. So don't take this too personally if I see anyone. Methods have a lot in common, but we don't use a common ground. Nothing we share between methods, or very little. We, <coughs> uh, we use the alphabet, yes, but um, as I said, uh, not even uh, simple terms um, or have the same definition. And maybe finally, the most important thing is that methods are theory only meaning you have uh, books, you have websites, you teach it, you have training, you, uh, everything on the training side, the learning cycle of work. But when you come to delivery, there is basically very little support more than comp uh, consulting. So there is a big gap between learning and doing. And that gap I actually have called the Achilles heel of the methods adoption. Mm. So I think this is immature uh, and actually foolish if I want, uh, if I go a little far. So what can we do and uh, what need to do? I think we need to recognize the problems and acknowledge them. That is why I think uh, the problem is people may see this as a problem, but they don't really acknowledge and, uh, and, uh, and recognize it. Uh, and we need to address the problems. Um, we do that, uh, not about uh, thousands of people and, and actually the big community now that are uh, trying to address this problem 
and essence uh, the OMG standard in these use cases try to help. Okay, I'm sorry for this long talk, but that's the best I could do. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So some really interesting uh, perspectives. Uh, and if you stop sharing your slides, uh, your uh, screen there, uh, Ivor, that would be uh, fantastic. And there's so some really, really interesting uh, points in the in, in the chat as well around what maturity is. And um, Mike, you, you made a really interesting point about maturity is completely the wrong goal. Would you like to maybe elaborate on that a little? Yeah, I just think that when we become mature, I mean, it just reeks of like, I don't want to try anything new anymore, right? I mean, I think about being a, a teenager and being immature versus like, you know, my dad and, you know, he was mature and stodgy and stuck in the mud. And not, of course I am now, but um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be mature in that way. I want to try new things. I want to fail at things. I want to see what works. I love what, what Ivar just described. I've been a big fan of that type of an approach for quite a while where it's like, I don't want to deal with frameworks. I, I People know me as a scrum guy, but the two things I'm most known for come from extreme programming, right? How can that be, right? It's because I don't really care about the methodologies. We want those, those practices within them. And they're not mature or not. They just exist. How a team uses them may be good or bad, and maybe we can apply the term mature, but I just don't like that word. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And, and, and I guess there's subjectivity over what's good and what's bad, depending on, on the, the, the situation and context. And so, so much, so much changes. So, Angela, I mean, you're, you're known uh, for, for many spheres, but the business analysis sphere and the agile sphere um, particularly. Um, I mean, what's your view bringing in some sort of business analysis to this sort of organizational agility type conversation? Um, you know, how important is maturity and what, what gets in the way? What gets in the way of, of becoming better at, at being, you know, having that enterprise level agility in your experience? Put me on the spot, Adrian. Yeah, sorry, Angela. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, well, you know, when I think about business analysis maturity, you know, obviously a lot of us are familiar with the BA Bach and a lot of people say, oh, the BA Bach isn't agile. And I think quite a few of us on the line here that were part of it would say, well, it just depends on what mindset and lens you read it from. And what experience lens you look at these practices and tools, right? And so what this comes down to for me is it's all about mindset and approach. So every single technique and practice, whether it be a user story, a use case, or a visual model, you can do in a very non-agile way, or you can do in a very agile way, just depending how you approach it and how you look at it. Yeah. So when we look at frameworks and methods and practices and use these words that mean different things to different people, I really think it's all about your mindset and do you approach it with an experimental conversational goal is to learn mindset and to deliver outcomes or are you approaching it with a I must document and get this approved mindset <laughs> we kind of do into the spectrum yeah yeah which is interesting isn't it and sometimes there's an element of well as long as I document it to cover my own back then you know uh, uh, which is which is a cult there's a kind of organizational cultural element to this as well which segues us into another really interesting perspective which is around uncertainty and change and like you know there there isn't a business in the world I wouldn't have thought that hasn't been affected by COVID and lockdowns you know and in some parts of the world there's, there's still awful thing, things happening you know it's often said the pace of change is getting faster I don't know whether that's true or whether we're just noticing it more but how would you say that uncertainty and change affects the approach to um, planning analysis and and you know, and, and us having to uh, to pivot. So, um, uh, Andre, I wondered what what your view on that would be about uncertainty and change. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, I spend a lot of time in the uh, highly regulated world, and we don't like uncertainty. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we want a lot of predictability. We want a lot of clarification, and and that primarily comes from the fact that we're dealing with. Um, uh, uh, putting medicines in the market, right? So this is not a place that that fares really well with the federal government when you say, I don't know. So we find ourselves really struggling with um, how can we avoid being so dogmatic about that aspect of our work that we can't do things efficiently, but how can we let... Um, the sake of efficiency allow us to be lackadaisical in how we approach documentation uh, and how we approach improving our methodology. So I think 
we find ourselves in between those two spaces trying to make decisions not against a maturity model, but in the space of we're delivering at this rate today, what is the next thing that we need to do incrementally to continue to improve our ability to deliver? That's really interesting. So that, imp if I'm understanding correctly, Andrew, that implies you've got a whole bunch of planning horizons. You've got some stuff, some, you've got, you've got some long-term goals. You've got stuff that you're discovering along the way and you're having to adapt and you're having to communicate that in a way which instills confidence presumably of say regulators and you've got to do that in a heavily regulated environment wow i mean that's a case study on its own andrew surely right so, um, um so okay well maybe uh, i mean gladys if, if if we bring you into the conversation here um what's your view around un uncertainty and change and, and perhaps you know what you know what doesn't change what what thing is there anything that we sh we should define as being pretty static would you say yeah, I don't know if anything is static, especially this last year and a half has taught us everything we thought is stable <laughs> and we can count on just kind of even going out to a restaurant and having a meal, right? You thought, you know, how, how can that go away? Uh, but, um, but to everyone's point, and, and for those who don't know me, uh, I've done work in the business rule space for the last 25 years. And anything that came out in this last, you know, couple of years is rules and policy, Andrew talk about, you know, regulation and, and all that, all that's about rules. And funny enough, um, we work heavily with uh, Center of Disease Control for the last, oh, I mean, 10 years, 12 years. And we did a lot of work in, believe it or not, in immunization in the last 10 years. And that must be the most unsexy projects that anybody could think of because anytime I bring it up who wants to listen to uh, you know uh, <laughs> vaccination rules and so forth and guess what in the last year it became the most sexiest rules that you could think of right because and that's strange now what's you know what come to light in this last couple of years what I see with, with this change is uh, rules and policy become uh, um much more important and organizations realizing that because they need to know what their rules are and they need to change them fast and they have never had to face to change them so fast and that's in you know examples of rolling out vaccines and what have you uh, and we just seeing that in the space that we work with a lot there's a lot of notification in that and in the agile world and I'm, I'm seeing that as well uh, that uh, we talk about maturity and I think in the agile method, in my opinion, I just don't see that it's playing enough attention to rules, policies. And when I say, you know, rules and policy, I really mean those business rules, those rules that even if you don't have system, you need the rules, how you roll out vaccine, how, you know, what kind of doses can you get and so forth. The rules uh, that are important to your business. I, you know, I like to see those kind of rules addressed in either the methodology or anything when you're doing a project to think through that more carefully. And, uh, and I'm seeing that because of this last couple of years of change and, and people are coming to me and saying, hey, you know, we really need to know what our rules is because we need to change them now and, and yeah. we don't know how to. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I suppose it's, it's sometimes there's the, the, the analogy of like, it's it's often hard to change the thing without knowing the thing you're changing before you change it or or it's possible but it's dangerous because you know what i could knock a wall out in this house and hope it's not a load bearing wall but it, you know there could be some consequences of of doing that if i if i haven't got uh, the 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 understanding so um uh, joy i wonder i wonder whether you've got a view on uncertainty and change and how it might affect um you know planning and analysis and those sorts of topics yeah for sure um and to be fair, I don't work in the world of vaccines and less regulation things. So my view is probably going to go a little bit to the other side of a adapt and roll with it. Um, so here's the thing. Look, I think everybody here would say if on your project you knew everything perfectly at the beginning, then you wouldn't use an agile approach. That wouldn't necessarily be your efficient answer. Maybe it would. But that's so rare that we're in that situation, you know, as the world is clearly handing us on a silver platter to learn that lesson now. Um, so, so with that, right, these, um, these agile methods and things are perfect for that because it is about constant change and adapting to what's happening in the moment. 
um, you know, because we just don't have the certainty. Um, and so for me, like, I am a fan. I mean, I may not go take a wall out of your house without finding out if it's load bearing. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, promise I won't do that. But when we think about systems that we're building in architecture, um, I do think sometimes organizations are too hesitant to let's get everything laid out perfectly yeah. at the beginning. And they're, yeah. they're so scared of the rework that's going to happen. Like if I architect the system and I build the database, this, I, I, if I build it wrong, oh my gosh, it's expensive to fix it. You know what? Like rework is going to happen and we need to embrace that and be okay with it. And, and there's a balance, right? Don't go to the extreme of don't plan at all, but plan a little, right? So you can imagine if you've got a year long project, please don't take three months trying to get the perfect architecture because you're still going to miss something. So instead, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, get something out there. It's interesting, isn't it? And I think there's um, there's sometimes the illusion of certainty. It's like, well, if we have this Gantt chart that's three years, you know, three years long, well, well, it'll go like that. And like we've all worked, we like we all know it's like it's it's theatre, really, isn't it? It's never <laughs> actually going to happen like that, you know. And um, so 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 it's sort yeah. of an an interesting dilemma. But as humans, we seem to crave that certainty, and, and perhaps it's sort of uh, dr drilled into us. So just before we move on to a, a, a different topic, um, Brianna, I wondered whether you had any perspectives on sort of, you know, uncertainty, change, analysis, planning? Of course I do. So uh, <laughs> when I think planning, I always think the um, old Eisenhower saying, plans are worthless, planning is everything. So planning is not about coming up with a definitive plan, gun chart, Excel spreadsheet, whatever. It is about creating options and seeing the options. So when, um, and, and I also work in a project environment, of course, I have a practice of people. My message to everyone within the practice, and that's project managers, analysts, developers, testers, everyone is first in the ambiguity and change environment. And that's literally every day we live in. Planning is everyone's job. Analysis is everyone's job. You can't say I'm on a cross-functional team, but I only do testing. Analysis and planning is part, intrinsic part, enabler of everyone's job and everything that everyone puts together as collaboration. And it's not an end game. It is not, as we were saying, there is no like, we achieved maturity and planning and analysis and here we are going to live ever, uh, ever happy, etc. It's It's not an end game. And it's yeah. not a single role's accountability. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, actually, as you were speaking there, Bri Brianna, I was thinking about almost the, the difference between, like, it, like in some organisations I've worked with, plan has been a noun rather than a verb. It's deliver a plan. It's a thing. Whereas actually, I, I, and the more I hear you, you speak there, it's about that planning. It's the verb. It's the It's the taking your mind there before you take your body there trying to work out what might stop you like if you were planning a, you know, even if you're just planning a drive to the airport or something you'd think about well what if that road was shut or whatever and, and pivot along the way so um fantastic well let, let's move on to a slightly different topic we've covered a, a whole range we've talked about you know maturity and maturity being more than a number and, and actually we've got to adapt and, and 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 shift we've talked about uncertainty being just the reality that we live in and planning being more important than the plan. Um, so I wanted to reflect on sharing of practices because clearly um, in, in software development, it, you know, agile software development, uh, as a community, we, we've learned a lot over the past you know, few, few decades. And what I was wondering is, is there stuff from agile software development that we ought to be sharing as a community with the rest of the world? to you know to help with enterprise level agility and also is there stuff from else in the enterprise that we should be bringing into our world so um who should i go to let me get a uh, scott scott i'll put you on the spot with that one <laughs> sure always happy to be put on the spot um so i think 
what I generally uh, advise to with uh, non-software people is shorten your feedback cycles. You know, get get something out the door quickly, um, get feedback on whatever it is that you're doing as quick as you possibly can. But your work doesn't need to be perfect. You don't need to have a, you know, a completely fleshed out answer or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish in order to get feedback from other people. Um, also, you know, you need, you want to work and learn together. Um, I think the too many people want to go off, you know, to their cube or to their home office now and just work on their own, do their own thing, get it perfect, and then, you know, declare it to be done. And then that's it. Um, that's no longer realistic. Uh, we, we just, I, and arguably never was realistic. Um, and then I think the third thing is choose your wow, learn how to choose your own way of working. Um, one of the, you know, we, we've sort of been hitting on this uh, throughout this panel, but one of the, the, the things that seems to have gotten forgotten uh, over the years was that one of the fundamentals of Agile was that teams should own their process, that they should be allowed to choose their own way of working and to evolve it and learn and experiment over time. Um, and then the, you know, to Ivar's point, I think the, you know, the methods and the frameworks basically came in and said, that was, this is the official set of best practices that thou shalt follow. And if you don't follow these practices, you are evil. Um, and then, you know, um, bad things happen from there. And I think it really messed up the messed up the overall community. So uh, be flexible, um, learn how to choose your own way of working, be prepared to learn, be prepared to, uh, uh, to evolve and experiment. Sometimes those experiments don't work out so well, and that's okay. Um, move on, um, you know, try again. Adrian, can I ask Scott a question about that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mike. Scott, I, I agree with everything you're saying. The thing I'm wondering about with the choosing our way of work, again, 100% agree. Yeah. Do you really think it was kind of methodologists enforcing that on teams? Some of that is true. Or was it we were getting to the teams that wanted that? Because that's what I see a lot of, where teams are just like, tell me how to work. I, I don't want to have to think about my process. Just give me the full description. What do you think the mix is? It, it, it's definitely a combination of both. But at, at the same time, you know, um, it's not the nicest metaphor, but it's like the drug dealers were selling drugs <laughs> to the drug addict, right? <laughs> Who do you blame? Everybody. Hey, how about <laughs> so it's it's from is the gateway so... drug to safe or something? So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I want to add it though, because I think there's another dimension to this for, for Scott and Mike on this, yeah. and that is a value system. So when I think about when I'm working with teams, how much do you prescribe versus let them decide on their mm -hmm. own way of working? A lot of it comes into play where I'm listening to how they wanna work, but I'm also listening for, are they following the value system of agility? And, yep. and those principles and values that we're, we know of with, with agility and agile. And that's where I feel like some of the balance comes in is, it's like, okay, that is one way of working, Let's look at how that aligns to the value system of quick feedback loops, of customer first, of working together as a team, and and all the values that we know. Transparency is another big one, right? So, well, yeah. can I throw it, in a it, comment, exactly. on that, uh, Adrian? Uh, yeah, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead, but, Howard. Uh, you know, I just think uh, in terms of who's to blame. Uh, <laughs> Not to put a finger on anybody, but uh, you know, it, the original Scrum guides uh, did say, you know, if you you can do what you want, but if you don't follow this exactly, don't dare call it Scrum. So when you put that kind of a word out, you certainly are, you know, creating an expectation. Asking, uh, yeah, you're that, asking that's lunacy. Uh, you know, personally, while working on my own book, I had, I had editors from various areas coming in, and, and uh, this is one comment I actually got, won't say who, but um, nobody has done more to destroy Agile than Scrum. Like, you talk about a war and somebody comes up with a comment like that, it's... Uh, you know, it's sort of almost a call to arms. So I think, yeah, there's definitely responsibility on all sides for this. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's clearly a, str a strongly held view by whoever. A, a, a Very expert. strong. <laughs> this was a Kanban yeah. supporter, by the way, versus yeah. a Scrum. I think, okay, honestly, then. I think the fear from the Scrum perspective is, you know, Scrum has a lot of counterbalancing elements. And if you take something out of that, one of the other ones can kind of go wild and blow it up if you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but to the other point we we're talking about from the business side, one of the things that has been interesting for me over the last years, last while is that for over a decade, you know, I've been associated with software stuff because of my work on the BA bot. But the reality is that I've actually lived most of that time on the business side. You know, um, I spent a year and a half running a 
Association for Libraries in the la last little while. And there's a ton of stuff on the business side that relates back to Agile. If you look at, you know, theory of constraints and lean, Agile practitioners have studied these things. They know about these things. There are business business equivalents to develop and improve processes. And in fact, I only really got Agile from studying lean. I read about Lean, I read about how Lean was supposed to work, and at some point, light went on. I said, oh, this is what you're trying to do, you know? Um, so I would, I would advise people to take a look at that kind of stuff, too. Yeah. Um, and my, in my experience, it's, you know, you're trying to create a high-performing team, and to do that, you need safety and you need high performance. But this concept of transparency, what I see happen is it's the teams that are being transparent, but that's not up to organization. And so that's not creating safety, right? It's like suddenly I'm willing to bear my work. I'm willing to make everything that I do transparent. And if it opens me to criticism, that's not cool, right? I'm going to go back into my shell. So I totally understand teams that want to revert, it, it, you know? So you have to mm -hmm. kind of move it up the chain. It has to be yeah, reciprocal. So oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when Adrian, you asked, what can Agile teach the world? I want to flip the question. What can the world teach Agile? Yeah. Teams, right? And, and it comes down to... I really think we work really hard in our personal lives in our, and you take this to any level of the world, your personal, your family, uh, your constituency, politics, global politics, it's all about value systems. And it's hard in our personal lives to follow a value system, yet we all work hard to do it on various levels, right? And uh, I think we can bring that into agile teams and enterprise agility. What's the value system that we're after? What's the value system as a team? and as an enterprise all the way up and down. Um, and I want to jump in here then and, and second what Kevin just said, so, you know, the business side picking up agile and, and a good example of that is we're working with the New Zealand government and in New Zealand government now, they have an approach of getting policy legislation into systems all in one agile team. And they literally have the policy writers, the legislation policy writer, the lawyers, and the developer and business analyst, rule analyst together and cycling these government policy legislations uh, from beginning to end in an agile fashion and get it out there. And the idea is that that linkage of what they want to give to the public is the same as what the public will sense when they get onto a web page and experience it. And it's getting actually recognition all over the world and, and the project has won several awards. So that's, you know, some of the big efforts are going on on the business side for Agile as well. Yeah, yeah, which is which is interesting, isn't it? And one thing I've been th for lots of, for, for lots of very complicated reasons that if we were all in a bar, I would tell you over a beer. Um, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about um, policy agility and legislative agility recently. And you sort of think it's it's interesting, isn't it? Or, or to me, it's interesting that, that some organizations have a de developed a capability to, um, in, you know, change products and, and, and get them out the door. But actually, some of the fundamental policies that, that run the organization that are, are, are dragging them down. You know, they're, they've almost got this conflict between an engine which is working really, really well. Um, but actually, this this governance framework, which is almost trying to stop the work that's happening, uh, happening, happening down there. Um, I mean, Scott, I wonder, do you ever see that? Do you ever see situations where like, like governance at the enterprise level gets in the way of stuff that's, that's, that's actually delivering closer to the shop floor? It, well, that, that's pretty much the definition of traditional governance, actually. <laughs> um, so, I, unfortunately, um, it, it, you know, I, I'm being facetious, but I'm also being, you know, bluntly honest. Um, the there's a significant misalignment between traditional governance approaches and um, actually producing value. Um, the, they, for the most part, they've devolved into bureaucracy and filling out of forms and you know filling out official templates and and stuff like that. And I I think it's a real problem. And but at the same time, some of this problem, I would point to, to the agile community on. You know, we we treat governance like a swear word and we have these phenomenally naive answers. Like, 
you know, for years, the scrum guys were running around saying, oh, you, you want to find out the status of your team? Just attend the 15 minute stand up meeting every day. So, yeah, you know, the, 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 vice, the vice president of whatever is going to attend the 15 minute stand up meeting that's occurring at 9 a.m. on all 50 of the teams in his group. This is the way they're going to get status, right? This is completely naive. Um, and frankly, if I could peel 15 minutes every morning out of my schedule to, to attend one status meeting, it would be, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, stand up meeting, um, then it would be, then, then it would be, you know, amazing for me, right? So um, a couple of years ago, I, I was uh, working with this one, this one organization on the business side of the house. And there was a struggle with getting agility onto the, you know, in, in you know, out of out of IT, and I was you know, exploring the issue. And and the, this one executive said to me, "It's like, you know, so I was trying to figure out why aren't you listening to these agile coaches? Why aren't you why aren't you working with them? Because they can add some value." And he said, "It's you know, listening to these agile coaches is like listening to a, a, a yappy chihuahua." It's like, yap, 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 scrum, yap, 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 software development, yap, 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 some naive co concept. And there's no real value coming out of them. They, they don't understand what I'm dealing with. They have no background in, in, my, in my domain. And all their answers are naive and, and based on, you know, what's convenient for the software team with absolutely no understanding of the implications on the rest of the business. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's like this yappy, you know, what do you do with the yappy little chihuahua? You ignore it and you hope it goes away. And, and that's about it, right? And this is the way I treat these coaches. Like, I, I hope they go away um, because they're not helping me. Um, yeah. So this is a real problem. Like, you know, so we need to listen, um, you know, yeah. less yeah. yapping more listening and actually taking time to learn about this legislation stuff, you know, legislative stuff or finance stuff or procurement stuff or, you know, whatever stuff you're trying to help this, the rest of the organization with um, because the software stuff is not going to get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. Understand the stuff in the broader e ecosystem. As you, were, as you were talking about the yappy chihuahua there, I was thinking about, yeah, it's kind of like you throw a ball to make it go away. You know, you kind of try try and distract it for yeah. a while, and then, and then, but it always comes back, and then you have to throw that. <laughs> so it's kind of so. So I guess we're we're starting to get to one of the questions, which is I, I think the real crux of of why we're all here here talking today, which is you know how do organisations level up to a position where they can um, change as quickly as the market, right? Because I mean that's part of what what organisations need to do to survive. I mean, there's a question about whether whether the market changes the organization or the organization changes the market and, and, and so forth. But, um, you know, I mean, maybe if I bring, bring joy in here, do, would you have any views on what an organization can do to, to kind of bring agility up, up sort of, you know, up to that organizational level? Yeah, I, I think that, and, and I personally, I'm going to talk from where it's not worked and the kinds of things that we've learned in those experiences. I think it comes back to kind of what Angela's talked about with like values and you just need to take a pause and look at, is your culture one that's going to allow that to happen? Yeah. Um, like massive organizations, uh, like we work with, I'm not going to name them, but we work with a Fortune 100 client that to make any kind of change ever, and we've worked with them for 20 years it's really, really hard because at the top of the organization, they're just not culturally aligned with where this is going. Um, to address that, you know, sometimes it's an outright outside disruptor. It, maybe it's the market is changing and they know that they have to change. Um, and, and I think some of it's education, right? That they don't, un I see less of this, but I still see it some where maybe the business or the executives, they're scared of things like Agile. Like, well, I won't have my plan. I don't know what to do with that. So it's really about teaching them and showing them by example that companies are not going to fall apart if we go down this path. Um, yeah. yeah, that's interesting, isn't it, Joy? Because, um, and, 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 and again, I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but like, you know, to what extent do MBA programs still teach a certain way of, of expecting the future to be planable? Right, mm -hmm. which is, is, is kind of interesting. So then you've got managers yeah. who demand plans because uh, they, they expect the future to be to be planable. But um, yeah. Mike, Mike, I wonder whether you've got any views on, on, you know, sort of getting the execs to embrace uncertainty and, you know, and the fact that sometimes the only answer, sometimes, let's face it, the only honest answer is, I don't know. 
but I've never really heard a man. I've never really met a manager who likes that answer. <laughs> Well, that any of us like that answer, but I've definitely met some and try to encourage them to be willing to say that, right? If we don't yeah. know something, admit it, um, and then go get the knowledge, which is a little bit back to your question about, um, you know, what can we teach businesses, which is, um, you know, Scott talked about rapid feedback. I think of it the same way, but I think about iterating, right? Yeah. What can we do next? And a lot of the organizations that I get involved with, either at the exec level or even a product level, they get really focused on the wrong question. Their question being, what should we build? And that's the wrong question. The right question is, what should we build next, mm -hmm. right? What's that one next step we should take? And if we get organizations focused on that, that's short as the planning horizon, right? I don't have to plan the whole big thing because I don't even know what the whole big thing is, but I can plan the next step, right? The next step, I mean, it might be a year long in, in organizations, but focus on the next step we're going to take and use that, iterate over that more quickly. And again, back to Scott's idea of rapid feedback. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Short, of, short of feedback loops. And, and Angela, I think you're about to jump in there. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we talk about, you know, what do we, how do we talk to executives about this to the, to follow on and add on to the same type of things? One, one conversation I like to have with executives is, okay, this project, you're thinking of building this big thing. You think it's going to cost about $2 million. So how about instead of committing $2 million budget, we commit a hundred thousand yeah. dollars and agree on what's that first thing to Mike's point, we can build that'll show us that we're on the right track, clarify some assumptions we have, reduce some risk. And what are those first three things we can do? So if I can get agreement on the first three things, maybe it's about $100,000 cost each, like a, a two-week sprint, for example. And then they're like, oh, and that's like, okay, after you spend each 100000 you can cut bait, switch, have that agility to pivot and change versus committing to $2 million at a time. Yeah. And they like that, but then they'll also be like, wait, how do I tell the CEO this? That That's not how they think. And so it's kind of funny. And the CEO will be like, I can't go to the board with that. So then it brings these questions about, you know, finance all the way from the board level and five-year projections out that boards are, are looking at. And it becomes, but then it's like, as long as you can talk them into, well, are we willing to try an experiment here? How about a two-week experiment and see how this works? So, so sort of hypothesis driven and, and, and actually actually see it. And that's interesting because as you were speaking there, I, I was thinking back to um, Andre and, and you, you were talking about, you know, heavily regulated and, 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 I, and I was thinking about, um, you know, Gladys and, and vaccines and these sorts of things, because, you know, I, I'm guessing that you don't, well, with a vaccine, it's experimental all the way through to clinical trials, I, I guess. So, I mean, Andre, in, in your you know, is there more of an appetite for experimentation in, in your world or is it just as hard as, you know, or, or, or do you have to sort of sell that that idea as much as the rest of us? <laughs> yeah, what, what I've seen is it's become a critical imperative. We, we have to be willing to experiment. And to Angela's point, it becomes a situation where now you have to break these big projects up into smaller bite-sized chunks, which I think really dovetails nicely back into our previous point about maturity. There's a real lack of maturity the first time an enterprise tries to do agile. So it's really, really helpful to take that $2 million project, break it up into a $100,000 increment, because now I get a chance to get some experience. So I bring that up because I think maturity is less relevant as a benchmark of where we're going. It's more of a healthy way to look at where have we been and what's the next thing from a maturity modeling perspective that's going to help us do this better the next time. I think if delivery is the primary driver and maturity is a great way to evaluate, not that you have to do something different, but you should consider it, we're looking at it in the right way. Yeah. I've got yeah. A, Adrian, can I come jump in and add something here? What works for me um, is that when we break these out, we focus on the business outcome to it, right? Not just breaking out the project as tasks, but breaking out, and for us, maybe easier, and we can even break it down to the decisions. It's like for this $100,000 chunk, you can now be able to assess membership, you know, whether you can have a consistent way of assessing uh, whether you can have uh, a member, eligible member or not eligible member. And so we're always tying it back to, you know, once when you know this decision and later on we'll know this other 
other bigger decision and yeah. be breaking it down from from the exact and that's how they communicate to the CEOs and the whatever levels because they can say now I can get I can roll out you know a something on the web a calculator on the web that now people can get you know whether the uh, the kind of mortgage can be uh, assessed so break it down to what it delivered to the business I think it's an easier conversation than just okay this is the chunk of work we're going to do in this hundred thousand dollars yeah I, I, as you were speaking there or, or as uh, you know uh, these topics are emerging i was thinking you know maybe we also need to define um because decisions are often easier when the decision criteria is transparent i, I would say mm -hmm. uh, and i'm wondering like maybe we also need need to define failure criteria in advance like actually we need to know what what is you know we talk about what how we know when something's successful maybe we need to say well actually it fails if these criteria are met because it's really easy isn't it i i, I well i've certainly been in situations where people kind of move the goalposts because they get emotionally attached to to something so um either it would be good to get your view on sort of you know agility getting it sort of up the organization getting getting it away from just just the software i mean the software of course is important or the product but do you have any views on on how we can get others in the organization on board and also maybe what we can learn from their world yes um in um software is um the first um um, area we approach, uh, I have been approaching, I have been working in, in my previous life with system engineering, but um, to uh, make these changes that I ex hope will happen sooner or later with the help of all of us, uh, we, um, we have to succeed with software engineering. But uh, many people are now using uh, similar techniques for systems engineering. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Essence is being used for um, innovation. Innovation uh, has uh, the, the thing you work with is not software. Mm -hmm. It's uh, any kind of product. So I think um, what, we, what we can learn uh, from <coughs> uh, software engineering is that it actually scales to a lot of other things, yeah. uh, system engineering, basically anything yeah yeah absolutely and and, and, a, and a good we could have a good conversation uh, but probably another panel uh, panel session about what a system actually is and, but that would turn into a systems thinking discussion which would be a topic for another uh, another uh, another discussion and indeed whether systems actually exist but that would be a philosophical argument but um, um uh, Brianna, I have one uh, interesting uh, other comment uh, when it comes to uh, what um, uh, Scott's mentioned that people like to be able to select their own, uh, their own uh, uh, practices, their own method. Uh, and um, uh, I, I assume some of you know about the Spotify model. <clears throat> the Spotify model is probably the simplest uh, method uh, uh, that is very little prescribed. It's basically only the organizational structure with squads and, and uh, tribes and etc. But what makes that so popular is that it is so little because anybody can, the brand Spotify is great. So if you have a great brand and you have something very easy that basically everyone who has ambitions to be a little bit of methodologist can fail. It makes it very popular. Yeah. There are similar patterns in other, in other uh, cases, but yeah. the Spotify model is getting very popular. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And there's, there's some, some interesting conversations about, about the Spotify model. And, uh, but I just wanna, I just wanna bring in just a, 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 a couple more perspectives before we move on and, and start to uh, close the session because we're about, about 10 minutes towards the end. How time flies, everyone. So many uh, excellent uh, uh, views. But uh, Bri Brianna, I was wondering in, in, in your experience, like have you got, got any views on, on on ways of getting that agility up to the sort of upper echelons and getting getting to sort of organizational agility well um first i would say it takes time it's yeah. not an instantaneous and it's not one size fits all 
and it's not something that uh, you can sort of pattern as a framework or a process. So, but um, while I was listening, I was thinking about um, heavily regulated um, industries and the misconception, which is very, very common when uh, people think uh, regulation and a lot of uh, uh, business people immediately go and say, oh, here is the regulation. This is what uh, is the requirement we have to do. It's, it's not exactly the case. It is an obligation. You then have to apply interpretation. Yes. And this is where good analysis and good stakeholder influencing comes to. And only then you can actually see the impact, the requirement for the change, what is going to happen. Like if you go through the classic um, people process systems, data flows. So I think that this is one area where we can actually contribute massively yeah, and help the business. Absolutely. And, and, and again, as you were speaking there, I was thinking change, any type of change is an inherently human endeavor. Like we talk about IT, we talk about processes. Those things are nothing without the people. Usually there, 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 are, there are some edge cases and exceptions, but actually it's people that get stuff done and, and, you know, people like dealing with people. So there's that whole human aspect of all of this that we, that we shouldn't overlook uh, as well. Well, okay. Uh, so final challenge I'm going to set for all of you. Um, and <laughs> and I'm going to put you all on the spot. Um, and in 20 seconds or less is like your biggest takeaway, your biggest ponder point. You know, the thing from today's session that you would want people to be taking away. Um, and since I'm putting people on the spot, I think it's only fair that I start with Howard because this whole thing's his <laughs> idea. So, so Howard, in 20 seconds or less, your biggest takeaway. Uh, well, one thing I saw here that came came through is that uh, the importance of analysis is actually greater in a time of great change versus lesser than you might think originally. Uh, yeah. And that is because, as has been mentioned out here, if you don't know what you've already got, you can't change it quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brianna, I saw you doing thumbs up there. So I'm taking that yeah. as volunteering to go next. <laughs> Well, my takeaway goes back to people and how important people are, even from uh, the fact that uh, we have this uh, community gathered uh, tonight and all the conversations, they ultimately go back to the people yeah. and what we can do as humans to contribute. Absolutely. Community, people, contribution. Um, Angela, if I could invite you to go next, please. There we go, found my unmute button. Um, I should have had the mouse already there, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, what am I thinking about in terms of takeaway? I am thinking about, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought completely trying to find my unmute button. Come back to me in a minute. Yeah, yeah, I'll come back to you, no problem. No problem, Angela. Uh, Gladys. Okay, well, uh, I like to encourage everyone to keep policy and rules in mind. And if you do that and look at that from a business perspective, it will actually make your agile efforts more agile. That's, you know, compared to some people think that it will slow things down. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Iva. I think um, listening to everybody here, and I've been really listening is that uh, we share so uh, enormously much uh, about uh, the situation. And uh, in particular, of course, uh, Mike Cohn, he, he had uh, very nice interruptions and very, very clever ones. I, I like it a lot. And um, uh, my friend Scott, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, uh, others as well. It was really interesting to see we share so much. Why can't we we get to a more shared uh, understanding of how we should move forward when it comes to simple things like software development. Yeah, yeah. So actually, actually, there's, there, there is that sort of shared, maybe we, maybe we need more shared sessions like this. So, um, Dana. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, we've heard about risk, community 
education. We've heard a lot about frameworks and planning, and um, I'm just going to throw something out there, and it's the fact that we actually have load on to go faster. Yeah. So even though everything around us, we want to get do things, we want to get things to market faster. But actually, sometimes we need the time. We need to give our people the time and respect their time, so they can think about stuff, and that'll help us, you know, speed yeah. to market. Slow I down, think. slow yeah. down to speed up. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, Angela. Yes. Okay. I found the nugget in my brain that <laughs> took away for a minute. Um, I've been thinking about during this conversation that agility is is just it's not a destination. We're never, we're never there, quote unquote, right? It's, it's, it's always something we continuously are working on. And with everything changing and change environments and complexity, it hits at home that there's always more to learn. There's always yeah. more to improve on. Yeah, and learning is just such a key theme and the experimentation that's coming through. So, um, Kevin, uh, you're on mute, Kevin. <laughs> All right, that better? That, that's good. <laughs> All right. You know, there's a saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And while I would say that's true, I think it has methodology for a midnight snack. Uh, you know, a couple of people stress the uh, importance of high performing teams, of safety, you know, and that's the stuff that you have to get right before any of this methodology stuff is going to work. If you don't have the culture, you know, you're going to have the, the agile people come in and they get to be, you know, as Scott said, the yak chihuahuas. And that's about the impact they're going to have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Scott. Yeah, so I want to leave everybody with a question. So what excuse is preventing you from improving? Wow, that's, I, I, wow, I, that's, uh, I, 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 that's, that's, I love it. I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to reflect on that one. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Mike. You make me follow that. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> I'm struck by Ivar's <laughs> comment about what's coming next, right? And he had his 30 year history up there. I've thought about that a little bit and I'm, I'm a little bit scared about what comes next because I worry that we're at the end of teams. Um, the last 20 to five, 25 years or so have been the era of teams. And I wonder if we're nearing the end of that and if the whole work from home has accelerated that where we're not gonna be teams, we're gonna be collections of individuals. And a really quick last one. Um, I'm also struck by our comments, our discussion about uncertainty. Um, and if we think about an ultimate uncertainty, I'm thinking about um, Elaine's situation, right? And, you know, how could he have planned for what he's dealing with right now? So um, tremendous uncertainty in our personal and professional lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Joy. Um, so I'm going to go with something that I kind of play off this, something I live by in my personal life um, as it relates to thinking about values. Um, and, and when you're faced with challenges and apply it to the work that we do. And it's really just knowing that it's underlying everything, every challenge is that most people truly do have good intentions. So in the context of people pushing back on you on process or maturity or decision-making or just making progress, when all of that is very abstract and great anyway, just back up a minute and understand, do they have good intentions? Um, and you just need to maybe think about it from their perspective. Um, perspective is so like putting ourselves in their shoes to see the world from their perspective. So fantastic. Thanks, Joy. And last but not, by no means least, Andre. Just making sure I wasn't on mute. So I, I think one of the things that jumped out at me, two things that really jumped out, I'll only speak on one for time's sake, is uh, there was a comment about agile enough in the chat. That's the one I really want to touch on. But I also want to point out there was a lot of comments about failure and, and fear of failure in that particular area. I think agile enough stands out to me because it, it goes back to a, a comment that I heard in real estate that um, you should always go as far as you can see, because once you get there, you'll be able to see further. I think when we think about agile maturity, we need to think about where we are and how far we can see, get there and then worry about how to get to the next horizon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, some really great uh, nuggets for us to uh, close on. Uh, just before I hand back to Howard, I just want to extend a really massive thank you to all of you. Uh, and, uh, and and apologies if you, if, if you didn't get all the airtime you would have liked, but uh, but I think I think you've all roughly had roughly even airtime and we're just about on time. So, uh, so I will hand back to Howard because, of course, uh, there, there is a reason that this session is happening. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, although it is free, entry to this webinar, um, you have to pay to leave. So if you want to close Zoom, you're going to have to um, open the, Go, the, the, you know, the GoFundMe uh, link. So anyway, Howard, over to you. 
Thank you, Adrian. And thanks for incredible moderation. This was a, a huge challenge and you've really, really risen to it. I'm glad that we had you here. Uh, I wanna thank everybody here. That's all of the panelists and all the people who have attended. Uh, you've treated us to a really, really enlightening conversation. This has been a real example of agility in practice and that this whole thing only came together as a result of a, a, a need that uh, you know, became apparent just, just two or three weeks ago. Uh, and it's all happened very, very quickly. Uh, I thank everybody for, you know, for putting in, for, for doing so much to, to make this successful. Uh, you know, we're living in a time of extreme change and uncertainty, as many of you have mentioned, and that we're all realized with the pandemic all around us. Um, so this conversation is really as timely as they come. Uh, I want to remind everybody again, just as, uh, uh, as Adrian, you've done, uh, to check your link at the end of the webinar. Uh, many, many thanks uh, from me personally, and also from Alain Arsenault, who we're doing this for, who I was in touch with just yesterday. Uh, he's going into treatment today. So this is, I think, the best thing that we can do to uh, give him a good, you know, good vibes going in there. Thanks to everybody. It's an amazing community out there, the IT community, and I've really, really seen that over time. Many, many thanks to everyone. Thank you.